Thank you, worship team. Good morning, Shore Christian Church. What a beautiful day, beautiful faces, beautiful family, and we get to learn from God's beautiful word today. Uh, this is going to be the conclusion of this Nehemiah series that I know has, it has really touched a lot of people's lives. Uh, just the feedback has been phenomenal as we hear this story of uh, a man seeing something rebuilt, and it has resonated with so many people who have lost something. Uh, I think that every single person, if you live long enough, you go through the experience of loss. Uh, something falls apart in your life, and it can be really challenging to get the energy and the faith uh, to ask God to rebuild that. Uh, but God is faithful, and if you just glean from what Nehemiah did, he was a man of faith, he was a man of focus, he was a man that did not allow the world to distract him from what God called him to do, his mission, and he saw that rebuilt, as we saw last week, in 52 days. And I believe that that is something all of us can glean from, is something uh, falls apart, something uh, uh, is broken in our lives, God can rebuild it. That's who he is. And so now as we close, we're going to find out what comes after that. After you, you see that restoration, after you see something rebuilt, what comes after that? And uh, that's what we see here. Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8. Uh, we saw last week that the wall has been rebuilt. Finally, Israel has its city back. Finally, it has a place where uh, they could come and worship God. They could find protection. They could find refuge. Uh, they could see their, their nation rebuilt. They could bring their families back home from exile. And it's, a, it's an incredible time. A, a lot of them have never experienced uh, that before. They've never heard the word of God before. And now now they're going to get to experience it for the first time. And so Nehemiah chapter two, uh, 8, verse 2 through 3. Uh, so it says, uh, on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra, Ezra who was the high priest, Ezra was the preacher. And so the preacher, the, the pastor, the priest uh, brings up the book of the law, the word of God. And so Ezra starts talking about the word of God and reads it before the people, uh, which was made up of men and women and all who are able to understand and he read it aloud from daybreak until noon. I mean, that, that's, pretty, uh, that's, that's pretty awesome, right? I think we should start having our services from daybreak until noon. And yeah, let's take a vote right now. Who wants to, who wants to keep this service going until noon today? And, all, the, <laughs> uh, all right, so uh, daybreak until noon, and he, he reads it in the, in the square in front of everybody, in the presence of men, women, all they could understand, and the people listened attentively to the word of God, to the book of the law. Uh, and then verse 5, it says, Ezra opened the book, and all the people could see him because he was standing above them like this, on a, on a stage, on a high pedestal. Uh, and as he opened it, all the people stood up guys could remain seated, but uh, everyone stood up. They were, they were in, in reverent honor before God's word as it was being read. And then Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, amen, amen. That's where we get that from. It's in the Bible. It's a response. It's saying, I, I believe. I stand with God's word. I, I respond to it. And, and that's why, you know, in church, it's not supposed to be just a silent, okay, let me listen to the word and go home. No, you need to respond to the word. Uh, God's word should bring something out of you, a response, a praise, an affirmation. That's what God is asking for. Do you do you respond to what is being said? And so they responded, but then this was the problem. This was very interesting what happens. Verse six, and then they bow down and worship the Lord with their faces to the ground. And then verse nine, it says, then Nehemiah, the governor of, Israel, of Ezra, the priest and the teacher of the law and the Levites all were instructing the people and saying to them, this is a holy day, holy day to your God. Do not mourn or weep for all the people have been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. They were, they were all crying. They were weeping because for the first time, they had heard the word of God. For the first time, they realized how sinful they were. For the first time, they realized how sinful and horrible 
they had been living, that they had not been following God, that they had not, that they'd been lost. They'd been like that one sheep out there. They'd been like the prodigal son, just, just squandering their life, wasting their life. They thought that they were doing the right thing. They thought that living selfishly and living for themselves and living to be happy was, was the right way. But now they're understanding that there's a new way to live, that God uh, is, is, has a new plan for their lives. And they began to mourn in regret. God, why did I waste all those years? Why, why was I living that way? And now they start to mourn and weep. And the amazing thing is, is that Nehemiah looked at him and said, no, that's not what you're supposed to be doing. Because when you hear God's word, it is not something that should make you sad. It is something that should make you glad. And it, it's, I don't know if you've ever gone on to do something, you know, fun with your family. And, and you know, us, we've done that before. And uh, it just so happens if one child has a bad day, they, and, and, and you know what? It's, it's hard for kids to, like, compartmentalize, like, their sadness and their struggle and their correction. And now let's go have a good day. That's over. You know, they let it carry over into the rest of the day. How many has ever done that as an adult? You know, you, you mess up, you screw up, and then you allow that to just carry over. And it just ruins your day. It ruins your week. And you can't even be joyful. You can't be glad because you're just so remorseful and so, so much guilt and shame because of what you did. And, and now it's ruining your future. I think it starts as a child, and a lot of people, as you get older, uh, the same thing happens. But God's word is never meant to bring guilt and shame on you. It's not meant to make you sad. And so this is what Nehemiah says. He corrects them, and he says, verse 8, uh, I'm sorry, verse 10, Nehemiah says, Stop, go, and enjoy delicious food. Yes, do I hear an amen? amen. I love my God. Joy food. I'm looking food and say, oh my God. I'm going to get so fat if I eat that. Enjoy it! <laughs> Pastor Ron is like, yes! <laughs> Hallelujah. Go enjoy choose, choice food and sweet drinks. Do I hear an amen? Yes! All right, here we go. And then I love this. Nehemiah says, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. I love that. God's word should always bring out of you two things. It should always bring out of you a spirit of joy over what Christ has done for you and also a spirit of generosity that wants to give to others what you have, what you have been blessed with. That is what the word of God is supposed to bring out of you. That's why yesterday was such an amazing demonstration of God's love and God's word and the church because God's word should always bring out of us, I wanna serve, I wanna give, I wanna reach out for those that maybe I could be a blessing to. I, I don't wanna be selfish with what I have. I want to give it. That's what God's word should always bring out of you. And this was yesterday for, for me, this is not really in line with the sermon, but, but for me and for our dream center, yesterday was a dream come true that we had uh, in our, in our uh, vision board five years ago that we wanted to do. And we never had the resources, we never had uh, the, the, the partners, and we never had uh, the manpower to be able to put it together until this year. And this was the amazing thing. Uh, we went ahead and by faith, we purchased all, this is what I love about God's people, is God's people respond when there's a need. They respond in faith. And we, we went out by faith and we, we purchased all the bikes ahead of time. We paid for them ahead of time. And then I just knew that every single one of them was going to get sponsored. Because I knew that we serve a great God that has blessed so many people that want to be a blessing to others. And every single dollar that we spent out on the outreach was donated to us ahead of time because of people that wanted to partner with us in that outreach and sponsor 120 bicycles for all of those children. And it was the most beautiful demonstration to see every child getting a bicycle, their families, uh, e even the, the, the assault bike and the row or the CrossFit station. It was like the biggest hit for the kids. I, I, I was like, the kids really want to feel that much pain, and they did. Uh, it, it was unbelievable from all the volunteers, the bouncy castles, and, and Steve Levine from the windmill just hooking it up. I mean, how amazing is it that you get to receive a bike 
And better than that, I'd actually take the hot dog before I take the bite. You know, unlimited windmill hot dogs and river sweet candies going over there and blessing our children and uh, our, our, our own volunteers from uh, Elizabeth and Linda with Hope Fits bringing out clothes. And I, I know that there were some volunteers that were like, I want some of that because it was so good. But because we do nothing but the best, right, Elizabeth? And it was just a beautiful culmination of generosity. And that should always be what comes from you. When God gives to you, I want to give out to others. I, I believe if you're not a generous person that you don't know Jesus. I think it is impossible to be a selfish person and know Jesus because then you, you know somebody else. You know Judas. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> I, I mean, if, if, you're, if you're not a generous Christian, then are you really? A, I mean, because when, when you receive the love of God, I mean, what comes from that? The fruit of that is generosity, to serve. I want to give back. And so uh, I was so blessed that we serve the God of Jesus here, the, the God that wants to give back. And so uh, this is what Nehemiah says. He says, give to those who have nothing. And then he says, this is a holy day to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Don't grieve. This is a holy day. See, I, I feel like we have messed up as we taught what is a holy day. See, we always think, think or, or maybe it's just our perception of a holy day is I got to wear my full, full three-piece suit. I got to have a stiff flip. I'm holy. Don't talk to me. God bless you, brother. I'm a holy man of God. Don't talk to me about what you did last night. We're in church. You know, sit up straight, child. And we yell at people. We're angry about people that aren't as holy as us. You ever find out the people that think they're the holiest are always the angriest? <laughs> but, but Nehemiah says, this is a holy day. What is a holy day? It's a party. It's a celebration. It's, it's saying, God, you've been so good to me. I'm going to eat. I'm going to drink. I'm going to celebrate. I'm going to be generous. I'm going to party. I, I love, I, I got to do like my favorite part from the mass. P-A-R-T-Y, because I got to. That's a holy day. A holy day is a party. It's, it's, not, it's not a, let's be as serious and sober as we can. It is a celebration. Let's be as joyful and joyous as we can. Why? Because God has been good to us. He is with a group of people who were once in exile. They were once lost, and now they have found their home again. It's a celebration. I know that you've made mistakes. I know that now you're understanding that may, there may have been some years that you have wasted because of your selfishness, because you did not prioritize your relationship relationship with God, but don't waste another minute in regret, in sadness over what you have lost, over the years that you have wasted. You have found Christ. You're in his house, and now let's celebrate because he has been good to you. He's been gracious to you. If not for the grace of God, I would be broken. I would be lost. I would be dead, but he found me, and he saved me, and here I am. Sinner saved by grace, baby. Perfectly imperfect because of Christ. That's good news. And we need to understand that. That's what Jesus, when Jesus came, Jesus was God with skin on. That's who he was. He, he came to show the character of our God. And when Jesus came, they didn't understand. We talked about this at the beach a couple weeks ago. They didn't understand why Jesus would hang out with bad people, why Jesus would spend his time with people who were sinners, who were lost. And Jesus told them this story. He told them a story about a coin, told them a story about a lost sheep, and then he told them a story about the prodigal son. And all three of those stories, when what was lost was found, you know what Jesus said we did? We party, we celebrate that the angels in heaven rejoice. They're not sad. If they're not sad, you shouldn't be sad. We all have something to feel guilty about, to feel remorseful about. We made mistakes. We have fallen short of the glory of God. We've all done things that we regret, but leave that in the past and allow God to write a new future for you. But you can't allow God to write that new future when you're still in regret of the past. Word for, don't let your past rob your future, because it will if you let it. And, and Jesus said, 
I didn't come to make you sad. I came to make you glad. I came to set you free. Why do we do that? I, I think one of the reasons we do that is, is we see the face of God the wrong way. You know, the, the way you view the face of God towards you is so important. You know, I, I, I know that the face of my father, my earthly father, when I would mess up, he was very gracious. And he would always correct me with a smile. He would spank me with a smile. It was very weird, but he would do it. <laughs> but I do remember there was one time I saw the anger of my father come out. And, and you do not want to see Pastor Dewey angry. One of the scariest things you'd ever see, right? Right, Mom, right, Diamond? And I remember, I'll, I'll never forget, I, I was 10 years old, and we just got back from Delaware, me and my dad. And uh, we're, we're huge baseball fans, and we were at Delaware, and we were at the Johnny Genostics. Uh, um, it was like a, a fair, or not a fair, what do they do when they sell things outside? An auction. The Johnny Genostics auction in Delaware. And they had all the, these, these old baseball cards. And my dad bought these two Mickey Mantle cards. A 1958 Mickey Mantle and a 1962 Mickey Mantle. And, and, and it was like he bought, bought some other really cool uh, cars that we were going to use as collectibles. My dad loved Mickey Mantle. It was my dad's hero. And, and I remember, you know, we, we had him in this safe. Remember that giant safe in the garage? And I remember I was going over my friend's house. It's so funny. Marie Butler's here. I went over your house to hang out with Jared. And I brought the Mickey Mantle cards to Jared's house because I wanted to show him. And, and when I got home, uh, I, I got home that night, my dad went looking for the Mickey Mantle cards. Why? I don't know. Maybe he just wanted to look at them. And, and they weren't in the safe. And as my father asked me, began to question me, um, he, he said to me, where are the Mickey Mantle cards? And in that moment, I realized I had left them at Jared's house because I am forgetful, just like Judah. <laughs> Judah's like, yeah. And, and then I remember my dad with the angriest face I've ever seen. He's like, where are my Mickey Mantle cards? It's like, ah. It's like, I think I left them at Jared's house. Please don't hurt me. But I'll never forget that. And I feel like, you know, for so many of us, and you've had your father or some authority figure or some uncle or, grand, or somebody yell at you that way when you messed up. And, and for so many of us, we think that that's what God does when we mess up. You did one last night! David! Yeah! Sorry. <laughs> and we think it's just a matter of time before he gives us like the cosmic smackdown. And, and, and that's the way we view our God. But that is not the face of our Heavenly Father. Our heavenly father does not respond to our mistakes the way that our earthly fathers do. Our heavenly father responds, because I'll tell you why. Because yes, we, anybody, anybody have sin in their life? Anybody forget Mickey Mantle cards at their friend's house when they were younger? <laughs> I, I, I mean, we all do. And this is what Isaiah 59 verse 2 says. It says that our sins have separated us from God. Our sins have caused God to turn his face from us. That, that's what Isaiah 59, like when we sin, God has to, he can't look at sin, can't wink at sin, he can't smile at sin, he has to turn his back on sin. And that's why when Jesus came and carried our sin, say he carried my sin, he carried it on his back, all of our sin, all of our shame, all of our regret, all of our, he carried it all. And when he was on the cross, the Bible tells us that he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Translation, my God, my God, why have you turned your back on me? That God the Father turned his back in judgment and wrath on his son because he was carrying our sin so that now he could turn his face towards us so that even in my lowest moment, even when I mess up, God is still smiling with love and acceptance and compassion because I'm in Christ. When you're in Christ, you're wearing Christ. So when God sees you, he doesn't see your sin. He sees your Savior. I'll tell you what, that's something to rejoice about every day that ends in why. And guess what? They all end in why. Sadness. Judy, remember that one time when we went to Great Adventure and uh, you weren't tall enough to ride on the ride? Remember that? 
long time ago. You know, it was very sad. Very sad. Anyone remember that as a child? You must be this tall to ride this ride. And then you realize you're not that tall, and then you go up on your tippy toes. But those people at the parks, they're, they're, they're smart people. And they say, no, 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 you're too short to ride on this ride. And then you walk away in sadness. Never feel like that's the way the gospel is for you? It's the way is Jesus is. You don't measure up. You ever feel like you don't measure up before? Maybe God has called you to something, but you feel like, I, I don't really measure up for that because I know myself so well. And, and I, don't, I don't measure up. I'm not, I'm not tall enough to, to, to ride that ride. I'm not big enough. I'm not pure enough. I'm not smart enough. But it's not about whether or not you measure up. It's about whether or not you're in Christ. And when Jesus came, remember when Jesus came in Luke chapter 4, he, he, he unrolled the, the scroll and he began to quote this scripture in Luke chapter 4. Uh, he, he, said, he said this, he unrolls the scroll of Isaiah and he says this in the temple. He says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, sent me to proclaim the freedom to the prisoners, recover the sight of the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled the scroll up, rolled it up. Right after that, gave it back to the attendant and said, today, this scripture is fulfilled. You know what Jesus was quoting? He was quoting an Old Testament prophecy from Isaiah 61. And he was saying, this is being fulfilled. But what Jesus did was he actually rewrote scripture. See, you could do that when you are the word. When you are the word, you could rewrite the word. Because what Isaiah had written in God's word, this is what Isaiah chapter 1 verse uh, uh, 2 says. This is what Jesus was quoting. It says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord, Isaiah 61, 1 through 2, is on me. The Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives, to release from darkness the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. That's what Jesus was quoting, but he misquoted it, didn't he? He left one part out of that prophecy. Did you pick up which part Jesus left out? The day of vengeance of our God. I find that very interesting because I think Jesus knew the word probably pretty well. And yet he left out the day of vengeance of our God saying, I am not here to bring vengeance. I am here to bring redemption. I am not here to bring anger. I am here to bring joy. I am here to set the oppressed free, to recover the sight of the blind, to give you a new life, to proclaim good news to the poor. I'm here for those things, but I am not here to show you the day of vengeance. That's the God that we serve, and that is a God that we could rejoice every single day for. Now, it doesn't mean there's not hard days, right? It, it doesn't mean there's not pain and sorrow. The, the gospel does not deny those things, but it shows us that they do not come from God. And even in the midst of them, because of our own mistakes, because of what was done to us or around us, God helps us through them. The Bible says in John, it says, uh, um, in this world, you will have problems. You will have trouble. But keep some joy in your heart. Be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. Weeping may last for the evening. There are things that will go on in your life, but there is always something for you on the other side of your weeping. There is always joy. There is always redemption. There is always a second chance. There is always a new life. I'm so thankful for a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance that God has given me so I don't have to live in regret and remorse any longer. The joy of the what? That's right. It only comes from the Lord. Doesn't come from another person. Doesn't come from a new house. It doesn't come from money. It only comes from the Lord. You can't find this at a department store. You can't find this on the internet. You can't find this through a person affirming you. You can't find it anywhere. You could only, only, only find it from the Lord. The cure to your weeping, the cure to your pain 
is not in a bottle. It is not in a prescription. It is not, I, I, I would go and say it, not in another person or in another doctor or another professional. I believe that it is in the Lord. That that's where joy, I'm not, I, I believe everything serves a purpose because God uses it all. But absent from the Lord, you're always going to be missing an ingredient. And I believe that Jesus is the sugar baby. I mean, you try and cook some, make, make some cookies without sugar, they're going to taste like wood. You're literally eating a bread. And, and that's what, you try and find joy without Jesus, it ain't going to taste good. You're not going to find it. Jesus is the sugar baby. There's some other ingredients that he may use, but if you don't have the sugar, then you don't have the real thing. Psalm 16, verse 11. I love this scripture. I might get this just tattooed on my back just because I'm feeling it this morning. In his presence is fullness of joy. Not in the presence of any person. In his presence is fullness of joy. And at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. You want real full joy in his presence. And that's what's amazing is you could be in his presence and surrounded by problems and still have joy. I love that about my Jesus. See, that's real joy. Doesn't deny the problems or the death or the sorrow, but it says I have something that is greater than the feelings that you have. I, I, I remember last Sunday, right after service, I'll give you an example of real joy. I'll tell you about real joy. I'll tell you how Jesus gives us joy in the midst of the most difficult situations. Uh, Linda Ayala, um, I think she usually comes to the second service. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, she went through one of the trials of her lifetime. Uh, her, it was her, her mother um, had, had an accident at home. She was older later on in life and, and, and fell and was rushed to the hospital. Came out of nowhere. We, we received the information uh, from Rick and Sandy and we've been, we were praying for, for her mother and, and they, they got the news that, that she, she, she had some brain damage and this is not good. The whole family was in the hospital gathering around and, and the doctors were telling her that you know, your, your, your mom's had too much uh, brain damage. She's not gonna be able to make it. This is not good. Uh, and Linda was by her bedside the entire time. And Linda loved her mom. The whole family did. She was an incredible woman. And she was experienced. She wanted to be there for the last moments of her mom's life. And she stayed by her bedside. And there was a, a moment where, where she had to go out and go home for just a second. And when she, when she drove home, Linda, uh, as she was on her way home, they called her and said, I'm, I'm so sorry, but your mom just passed away. You know, you don't need to come back right away. She just passed away. And when the, you know, it was obviously you get that news, it's devastating. And then 10 minutes later, she gets another call. And the call is, I'm sorry, uh, disregard that message. We just got a heartbeat back on your mom. You, you, could, you could come back and, and be with her. And Linda drove back to the hospital and was able to spend two to three hours with her mom listening to worship music, praying over her. And after that moment, her mom went off and passed away to be in heaven. But that's the joy of the Lord. And Linda said it was like God smiling at her, that even in the middle of this horrible situation that came out of nowhere that was, that was painful, she found the Lord in it. When you have joy, you find the Lord in every season, in every situation. Things that would steal most people's faith, you're able to stand short because you have the joy of the Lord. I, I remember uh, there was a woman uh, in this church, her name was Rosie Niffin. And uh, Rosie Niffin, uh, she, she went home to be with the Lord about six years ago. She was uh, one of the most generous people I had ever met in my life. Uh, she would drive around uh, and walk around with just a roll of $5 bills in her, in her car and in her pocket. And she would just go around just giving out $5 bills to people. She'd write on every $5 bill, Jesus loves you. You're special. Uh, and she would write these beautiful messages, just, just hand them out to people. And, and Rosie Niffin, out, out of nowhere, um, she got a, a, a report that she had cancer. And I remember going to visit her and she had it. Uh, it was a very, very painful form where it was in her, it was in her jaw and it caused her jaw to just be massive. It was so painful. 
and she was home on hospice. And I remember going to see her. And in her last moments, I was, I was there with her. And I remember hearing her sing. She, she sang this. It was a very popular song at that time. And as she was taking her last breath, she was singing this song. I believe in God the Father. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in the Holy Spirit. The God of three in one. I believe in the resurrection. He's coming back for me. That's joy. That's the joy of the Lord. That only comes from Jesus. And see, if you always live with this sadness, this regret, you're never going to be able to experience the joy that comes from serving the Lord. And Jesus is able to, to give us the strength to get through things we can on our own. You know, remember Judah couldn't get on the ride? Sad day, sad day. But then they would always say the one thing that if you're not this tall, if you're able to go with somebody who is, then you could go on the ride. And then your dad would go on it with you. And you'd get to go on the ride and experience it and smile and laugh and, because he was with his father. I'll never forget that. That always helps me when I feel like I don't measure up. If I have Jesus with me, then I'm able to measure up because of who's with me. I'm able to get through this because of who's with me. I'm able to keep going because of who's with me. It doesn't matter how difficult it gets, and it might have been your mistakes. See, sometimes our mistakes are the hardest ones to forgive. Some of you, you're, you're, you're great at forgiving other people, but you are horrible at forgiving yourself. And you just beat yourself up and you just say to your, how could I be so stupid? How could I have done that and, and hurt so, that person or so many people? And God's saying, if I've forgiven you, you need to forgive you. Stop grieving. Stop being so sad over what you have done. You are found. You are in Christ. You are forgiven. You are set free. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The peace of the Lord is your serenity. I want to say also that the blood of Jesus is your salvation and the love of the Lord is my security. Just repeat this after me. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The love of the Lord is my security. The peace of the Lord is my serenity. And the blood of Jesus is my salvation. Isn't that good news? That because of Christ, I have strength. I have serenity. I have security. And I have salvation. That is something to celebrate. If you're able to, just stand to your feet right now. I just want to pray over every person here. If you could just bow your heads, Lord. You know our hearts and you know what we have gone through and what we are going through right now. You know the mistakes that we have made. You know the hearts of the people that are hearing this message that have failed and fallen. And this morning, you're calling them back home. But when you come back home, do not be sorrowful. Be joyful. When you hear God's voice, do not be sorrowful. Do not feel condemned. But what should come from you is the joy, knowing that I am loved, that I am forgiven, that I have been set free. If you're in here this morning and you've lost that, that you've fallen, you've failed, and you want to say, Jesus, I, I, I need to get that relationship back with you this morning. I need that joy in my life. I need you to welcome me back into your kingdom. If that's you, I just want you to just say this prayer with me. Just 
repeat these words. It's, it's an outward display of what God is doing on the inside. And, and you could say it under your breath. You could say it loud, however you want to. But uh, let's, let's say it together. Dear Jesus, I'm coming back with joy because I am forgiven. I am set free. I have a new home in your arms. I believe you're God the Father. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in the Holy Spirit that you died for me and you rose again. I will walk with you and experience real life and real joy. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Give the Lord a big hand clap if you would this morning. Amen. 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 Are you joyful? So this is, this is your, uh, your homework. Anybody want some homework? Yeah, give me some homework. Go and eat good food. Drink some delicious drinks. Give to people that have nothing. Do not be sorrowful because the joy of the Lord is your strength. How many of you could do that today? Amen. Amen. Love you all. Have an amazing, amazing Sunday. We'll see you next weekend. If you want to receive communion, we'll have it available to my right. Uh, if you uh, need prayer for anything, uh, we'll have some members of our prayer team to my left. Uh, God bless you all. We'll see you next Sunday.